Good afternoon and welcome to our webinar on marketing and branding for restaurants. My name is Jean Hamburg and I am a trademark and copyright attorney with the food, beverage, and hospitality practice of Norris McLaughlin. Norris McLaughlin is a general practice law firm with offices in New York, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania, as well as extensive experience in assisting restaurants with all their legal needs. I am here with esteemed chef, restaurant owner, and marketing expert, Marcus Giuliano. We are here to help you guide you to help guide you through the legal and business considerations that will help you set your restaurant apart and drive patrons to your establishment. After each of us presents, there will be ample opportunity to answer your questions. But in the meantime, feel free to take advantage of the chat feature in Zoom and type your questions in. So with that, let's dive right into what is a brand, or, and I'm going to be using the term brand and trademark interchangeably. So legally, a brand is anything used to promote the sale of goods or services that identifies a single source of the goods or services. And that could be words or symbols. It can be the interior decor of your restaurant. It could be designs, product shapes, even colors can uh, identify a single source. When consumers see the trademark, they think of a single place from which the, your services originate. So some trademarks are actually better than others. Uh, the, the strongest trademarks are ones that are entirely invented and really don't have any meaning as applied to your restaurant. So Friday's or Chipotle or Domino's or Starbucks, these terms didn't exist in our vernacular in relation to restaurants until their owners came up with them. And the advantage of these completely invented trademarks is that they immediately identify a single source because nobody else has thought of them before. And so they're immediately capable of identifying your services. The next best type of trademark is a suggestive one, which says something about your restaurant, but doesn't completely describe everything you do. So Dunkin' Donuts, Blizzard, Shake Shack, 7-Eleven, and Burger King are all examples of marks that have some descriptive component, but they're not so much as to be completely descriptive. The issue with descriptive marks is that on the one hand, they do convey a lot of information, but on the other, they won't function as trademarks right away until consumers come to associate those descriptive terms with your establishment. So, for example, the lobster place is a great example, very descriptive. Over time, it became associated with a single purveyor of seafood, which then opened restaurants. Um, examples in the food world, corn thins and rice thins for thinly shaped corn-based and rice-based cakes. Too descriptive to be protectable, um, unless over time consumers identify solely your, your restaurant, your establishment with the mark. Um, some marks, or some designations, I should say, or names are just completely incapable of trademark protection, and those you should stay away from. Um, those are referred to as generic designations, which means that they identify an entire category of restaurants. So the pizza place or coffee house, nobody can own exclusive rights in those marks, in those designations. So how do trademark rights come to exist? Well, trademark rights are really closely identified with the consumer's association of the, the, the name or the logo or the, tra or the trade decor with you. So it's through use and commerce, it's through actual sales, opening your doors to consumers, that those designations become associated only with you. So actually, it's not necessary to register a trademark in the United States trademark office. Um, if you do want to pursue registration, you cannot uh, get the registration until you've actually started using the mark with some limited exceptions. Although it's not required, we do recommend registration. So why? Well, primarily because registration will confer upon you nationwide rights in your name. If you don't secure a trademark registration, you won't be able to pursue geographically remote restaurants that are using your same name, even if you used your name first. So this is especially important in a day and age where digital marketing, which Marcus is gonna be addressing, is so critical. 
if uh, a California establishment is promoting its brand and you're on the Northeast and you have the same name, consumers could easily be confused into believing that your restaurant only exists in California and may never even find you and it could really hurt um, you. But if you don't have a registration, you won't be able to pursue that geographically remote infringement if you've never made any sales into California. If you only use a mark, you'll only have right without registering, you'll only have rights where you sell. So if you are in New York City, you may only have rights in the geographic territory of your establishment and where you're getting your customers from. There are also a lot of procedural advantages to registration. Um, five years after the registration issues, nobody can challenge it um, except on grounds of fraud or genericness. So that's important too. You've then locked up exclusive rights. So before you use a mark, never mind register it, you should really clear it. And how do we clear it? Well, first, um, you contact an attorney who knows what they're doing, and that attorney will do a knockout search, typically starting with records of the trademark office, and maybe also with some supplemental internet searches, to see if there's anything that would immediately preclude your using the mark, because doing so would infringe somebody else's rights, because that person came before you. Um, after the knockout search, a full search is recommended. The full search is commissioned by the attorney from a search vendor that has a lot of databases and specializes in producing these kinds of search reports. Um, the search reports can be anywhere from a couple hundred pages to a thousand pages. And an attorney should be reviewing the search very carefully and then providing you with a written opinion as to whether the mark is available for you to use and register it. Sometimes a mark might be available for registration, but not use, in which case you shouldn't adopt it. And that's because maybe somebody else has a registration or application already on file, um, uh, doesn't have an application or registration already on file, but they're using the mark. So the other party's use will preclude your use, even if they haven't registered the mark, and even though technically you could get a registration, because the trademark office will only look at what's, uh, what's on file or registered in the trademark office. You will also get a written opinion, um, which can act as a defense should you ever be the subject of a claim of trademark infringement. If the opinion says the mark's available, then you had a good faith basis to proceed, and that's very helpful if there's ever a dispute. So what do you do? provide your attorney with once your mark is clear and you want to go ahead and register it. Well, you're going to have to decide whether you just want to, um, is, is there a symbol involved, a logo, is it just words, maybe it's a combination of those things. We usually recommend uh, filing an application for the words that are dominant in a design, separate and apart from the design. And why is that? Because you're going to have to maintain your registration down the road. And if you change the logo, but you still have the same name, then you won't be able to maintain the mark if it was filed in a very particular form. So if you're budget conscious, we recommend just applying for the name, the words. And you can always, um, later on, if you have more funds, then apply for the logo. Um, now, you're also gonna need to provide a description of what you're doing. Now, you may be doing restaurant services, group club services, but you may also be producing Perhaps you're producing craft beer or you're um, even packaging some of your, you know, your very popular sauces and selling those. Those are different services. Restaurant services and food are considered to be in different classes. That's what the trademark office calls different kinds of uh, goods. And this is a, a fee driver for the trademark office because with every new class of goods you add to the application, you're going to have to pay an additional fee to the trademark office. You're also going to need to tell your attorney if you've already opened your doors and you're welcoming customers, or if you intend to do so at some future time. We actually highly recommend that you research your uh, brand name and clear it well in advance of opening your doors and file an intent to use trademark application. Even though you'll eventually have to prove use, the intent to use application will give you a filing date that will beat out anyone who comes after you in the marketplace. So even if you haven't opened your doors, if you file that application and someone opens their doors 
after you file, you still have prior rights and you can still stop them based just on the application. Uh, in some situations, particularly where you're owned by a foreign entity, then you don't have to show use at all to get the registration because you can base it on the foreign registration. So I have a flow chart here, of two pages, showing you the application examination through registration process, just so you can get an idea why it's a good idea to hire counsel to guide you through the process. An application is typically examined anywhere from three to five months after it's filed, and both substantive and formal objections to registration may issue. The formal um, obstacles are very easy to overcome, usually involve changing some wording in your goods and services, um, perhaps submitting new proof of use if your specimens are rejected, but the substantive examination is more difficult. And this is where an attorney can help. If a search report did not show, show any prior conflicting references, it's most likely um, that any marks that come up are ones that the attorney probably saw in the search report and had arguments around. Um, so your attorney will be able to make substantive arguments since you've already probably thought about them in the process of hearing the mark. Um, and once all of the ob objections are hopefully withdrawn, the mark goes into uh, a publication, uh, literally is published uh, for third parties in the trademark register, which the third parties can look at and decide if they want to oppose. Perhaps someone feels that your mark violates their rights, notwithstanding this whole examination. Maybe they're a common law trademark owner, that is, they don't have registered rights. Um, once an opposition period passes, and that's a 30-day period, you then get your registration. This entire process, if, it's based, if the application is based on use, takes about a year. If it's based on intent to use following the opposition period, something called the notice of allowance issues, and then uh, a statement of use, which is just proof that you're out there and opened your doors, a photo of your restaurant or signage or menus to show that you're using the mark. Um, and then you get your registration. Um, an attorney should charge you a flat fee for all of the work through registration, except if there's a refusal, which is typically billed hourly. And so this is actually much more affordable than it may seem. Uh, and all of the reporting of every step of the application should be covered by the flat fee. Um, and then you don't really have to do anything until six years after registration when you maintain your registration. And then every 10 years from registration, you renew it. And your attorney, as part of your flat fee, should be keeping track of those deadlines and reminding you free of charge when they happen. So in addition to registered trademarks, I mentioned early on that other kinds of um, symbols and de even decor can function to identify your business exclusively. And those elements are often referred to as trade dress. Uh, it's the total visual image that's presented to customers. So when you're talking about uh, packaging and product labeling and product designer configuration, typically might be a shape, the shape of a Coke bottle, the shape of a Toblerone chocolate color. I think immediately of Tiffany, even though it's not in the food world because that turquoise is so associated with them. Um, the, uh, the, 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 even the size, it's very unique, can, can signify source. The important thing is that all of these elements have to be non-functional. So the bottle can't be shaped in a certain way because it's easier to fill or drink from. It has to be a purely arbitrary design consideration. And so the, the, there are really two types of trade dress. There's the labeling and packaging and design or shape that I've mentioned. And then there's also decor, restaurant decor. And a great example of a case that's in the news where restaurant decor was important was In-N-Out Burger suit against Puma. As you can see from these photos, In-N-Out uses a very distinctive design featuring the colors red and gold with a palm tree, a linear palm tree design. And it's everywhere. It's in the interior, exterior, and even the uh, packaging in which the food is served. Um, they've taken advantage of the popularity of their trade dress and sold everything, you know, socks, t-shirts, mugs, sold many things, merchandising their well-known trade dress. Um, Puma decided that it wanted to introduce a California drive-through uh, sneaker. Now, 
obviously calls to mind immediately the In-N-Out Burger, and right away consumers got it, and they started posting about the association between that design and the In-N-Out Burger. So this did not make In-N-Out happy, and they sued, and that litigation is still pending in California. Um, but the Supreme Court gave a real leg up to folks like In-N-Out in any restaurant when it found that uh, the decor of a restaurant is immediately protectable. Uh, you don't need to show that consumers associate it with you. If you have it, it's assumed they will. So that's really different from like a Tiffany blue or a Coke bottle shape, because in those cases, the trade dress owners had to show that consumers actually recognized the trade dress and associated it exclusively with those food producers, whereas, or in the case of Tiffany jewelry producer, Whereas with the restaurants, you have that as soon as it's designed. So that's a great benefit. So now let's talk a little bit about promoting your brand um, and what you're going to typically be using to do that in the restaurant context and many other fields is customer testimonials and photos. So the first thing to think about when you're considering posting a photo is whether anybody is shown in the photo because People have the right to commercialize their own name, image, and voice. They don't have to be famous. They just own that right. So that means that you're not allowed to use anyone else's uh, name, image, or voice in connection with promoting your restaurant without their permission. So we will typically recommend that you get from a good attorney a form of publicity release that you can use over and over and over again that your customers or anyone in your restaurant depicted in a photo will sign. Um, if you can't secure that and you want to include a customer testimonial, you will frequently see this. Only the first name is used, perhaps the first initial of the last name. That way, nobody knows exactly who they are. Um, if you're going to use a photo that a customer has taken, you have two layers of rights to think about. You have the publicity right, which we've just discussed, of anybody who's depicted in the photo, but then you have the rights of the photographer, because whoever took the photo owns copyright in the photo. And so it's important to get permission in writing from, in writing, please, uh, even an email saying, you have my permission to use the photo I photograph. Um, and additionally, if you're gonna hire a professional photographer to photo your, photograph your establishment, so, so you can put it on your website, very, very critical. Don't pay them until they sign over copyright through a copyright assignment to you in the photos. You do not want to end up on the receiving end of a lawsuit. Even though you hired this person, it doesn't mean that the copyright's conveyed automatically. So other important intangible rights you may own include trade secrets, which in the restaurant context can include recipes and formulas, methods of making things, processes, and design. And uh, trade secrets are basically anything that are kept confidential and that have economic value to you. So think about how you can prevent those secrets from becoming known. Well, first of all, you want to tightly control dissemination. If some formula or recipe is really critical to your business, only disclose it to people who need to know it and make it clear to them that this is confidential. It's wise to enter into non-disclosure agreements with folks that may be exposed to your trade secrets like chefs and think about employment contracts with non-disclosure clauses where applicable. Um, now, because there's a new federal law, relatively new federal law called the Defend Trade Secret Act, there are great recourses available to you to stop others from using your trade secrets. So important to protect them. I talk a, a little bit about assignments. You heard me mention them before in the context of, um, of photographers, but they're really broadly applicable to your business um, because uh, any time that you commission somebody to create something for you, whether it's a graphic artist or a website developer, you want to make sure that you own the copyright in the creative content. And that is only going to happen if you have something called an assignment. The assignment can, all, can be in the form of a trademark assignment, a copyright assignment, or a patent assignment, depending on whether you're dealing with the brand 
copyrighted content or patent. Frequently with graphic artists, you may want to have them give you a copyright assignment and acknowledge that they don't own any trademark rights because they're not going to be commercially exploiting the, the design that they've created. Um, patents cover inventions and copyrights creative works. So what are the key provisions of any assignment? So they should be in writing. They have to be in writing. They have to identify the parties. The, tr the conveyor of the copyright is the assignor. The recipient is the assignee. Um, they have to identify what or what's being conveyed, if it's a trademark. Uh, let's say you buy someone else's business and you want to uh, own their, you buy another restaurant, you want to own the trademark, there should be a conveyance, an assignment, even if the mark's not registered. Um, if it's a copyrightable work, then we often consider a schedule which actually shows the creative work, whether it's a piece of graphic card or even a, a, a print out of a website, so there's no confusion as to what is being conveyed. It should be dated and signed by the assignor only. Normally, only the assignor has to sign the part of conveying the rights. And this will facilitate your obtaining copyright and trademark registration. It will ensure that you're being clear to use all of everything you've commissioned without running uh, the risk of a suit by the person who created it for you, which is absurd, but it has happened. Um, and and you may want to consider, once you've built up these rights, um, it, commercial exploiting your restaurant name in ways other than just by offering restaurant services. And a trademark license or merchandising agreement is an ideal way to accomplish this. Licenses and merchandising are equivalent terms. They mean the same thing. And it's an agreement through which the trademark owner, which is licensor permits someone else, the licensee, to use the trademark in connection with specific products or services. So maybe you do want to offer that special sauce um, in, a, in a jarred form, but you don't have the expertise in, in making food uh, for, uh, for retail stores. So you hire it out and you license your trademark to someone else who will package it for you, maybe a private label agreement or a a co-packing agreement or something like that, and you're going to want to make sure that you have um, adequate control over the way the trademark is being used, that it's only being used in connection with your approved recipe, and that you have uh, quality control provisions. Um, so you want that sign writing. Um, it's technically not required. It's really hard to have a good license agreement without having all of the terms in one place comprehensively. So we, we just we just highly recommend that you have a clear writing. You have to, of course, identify the trademarks that you're licensing and whether the license is exclusive or non-exclusive. Perhaps you'd like to have more than one party involved in, in, in selling this in producing the same products for you. Of course, you have to identify the, the geographic region, uh, whether it's U.S. or outside the U.S., and quality control, I mentioned earlier, it's so important. If you don't have quality control provisions and you don't have the right to inspect, then you could forfeit all your trademark rights. It's called a naked license, so you want to avoid that. And you have to think about insolvency because the Supreme Court recently said that even if you go belly up, your license continues. <laughs> so that means that you have to continue to monitor the quality of the, the, the um, products produced under your trademark um, even if you're belly up, because otherwise you lose that entire asset, the trademark, which can be highly valuable. And to that end, you can use your trademarks and even copyrights to secure liens. If you have trademark registrations or copyright registrations, banks can grant loans based on the value of that property, and they can uh, file a, a, a security interest with the trademark office, and then once the loans are paid off, make sure that they file a release of the security interest. I'd like to address website copyrights. We talked about developers and how important it is to have them convey copyright to you. Well, it's really a good idea to co register copyright in your website. It's not terribly expensive. Again, the council usually charges a small flat fee. Um, the copyright office fee is $55, and you can do it 
for the entire site, there's a way to electronically convert your entire site into an Adobe document very quickly. You can deposit it with the Copyright Office with an application and not worry about it again until you do a major overhaul, at which point you can file another um, copyright registration. Um, when you're looking at registering copyright, you're going to have to uh, exclude anything that was created by third parties. So if you have stock photography on there, you're going to need to accept that. A good attorney will ask about that. And if you do have third party content, especially stock photography, make sure that your developer got the rights to it. Don't rely on them, even if they promise in their website development agreement that they're going to get the rights. And even if they indemnify you against any damages, don't rely on them. Look at the licenses that they're getting. Make sure you have rights in perpetuity and in, in whatever media you need them in. You may want to print the photos too. Um, Getty just makes a, a, a huge stock photo agency, makes so much money off sending letters to people who haven't paid attention to these licensing issues. So in addition to um, a good website development agreement and copyright on your website, you're going to want to have terms of use and a privacy policy. So terms of use is just a contract between you and your user. And it's more important if your site has more interactivity. Um, and also it, it, it provides a mechanism for people who are complaining that their content is up there without their permission um, to send a notice to you. You should designate someone um, at your organization who can handle copyright infringement um, complaints. Um, and also, if, if you have a, a way for people to submit ideas for improvement or suggestions, um, then it's important that the terms of use convey uh, the rights in those ideas to you, um, so that if you should use one of those suggestions, somebody that some cons the consumer who submitted it doesn't say, "Oh no, that was my idea; I violated my rights." The privacy policies have gotten a lot of attention these days, mostly because of social media platforms and others of use of uh, what we call personally identifiable information. Um, and that can be anything from your IP address, to, to, from your consumers, uh, your customers' IP addresses, to their email addresses, to physical addresses, credit card information. This is really critical if even you have a, a way to accept restaurant reservations on your site to make for people to make them using their email addresses or cell numbers. Um, and it's also important if you're using uh, your customer information in order to promote uh, your services or to process uh, commercial transactions when you have an e-commerce function. So the GDPR, which is a European Union law called the General Data Privacy Regulation, has gotten a lot of attention because it's very draconian. Um, Generally speaking, you do not have to worry about it unless you're specifically targeting new residents. If you are a destination restaurant, if people are coming from around the world, if, you, if a lot of your uh, geo-targeting shows you're getting people from Europe, then I would definitely work with a U.S. firm that has a good EU agent who can guide you through the nuances of that law. Um, in our own country, we have states that are increasingly enacting uh, new uh, and more restrictive uh, privacy laws in, in the total uh, paralysis of our federal government to provide us with some comprehensive federal law. Uh, we're now stuck with looking at all 50 states' laws, and California has one of the most draconian laws. So sometimes it may make sense to tailor to California's requirements, but not always. Again, you know, I would uh, get legal counsel on this to figure out if you need to worry about um, California law. And you may want to geo-target so that you only deliver the California privacy policy to the California resident. And I'm just going to speak briefly about enforcing your brand in social media. Generally, it can be done in an automated fashion. If you sell products related to your restaurant brand, there's a brand registry on Amazon through which you can enroll your trademark registrations and also enforce them. Um, if you're being impersonated, if someone else is claiming to be you, there are forms on Facebook and Twitter to deal with it, as well as trademark and copyright um, uh, forms that all can be handled electronically. 
by you or an experienced attorney. And now I'm going to turn it over to Marcus. Excellent. Very excited to be here. That was very informative. Um, a lot of things that us restaurateurs don't think of that I seem very, very important. So um, I love the marketing aspect of restaurants. Uh, that is uh, what I consider myself a marketing maniac. I own a restaurant in upstate New York for the last 16 years. And uh, besides providing great food and great service, I owe a lot of my success to marketing my restaurants. So I'm going to talk today about uh, some psychological marketing, which is really key. Uh, so let's jump right in. Like I said, restaurant owner since 2003. I write for Forbes a little bit. I'm a marketing maniac. I write some business books. And I'm a restaurant success coach. So when people log on to your website uh, or look, look at your business card or your brochure, they literally have a three to seven second uh, attention span, just like a gnat. So you've got to be really on your game and what you're conveying to be able to get into, uh, be able to grab people's attention. So I'm going to talk today about converting views of your number one platform. Your platform, your biggest digital platform, is your website. Most restaurants, all restaurants should have a website. That is one thing that is, uh, uh, that is crucial in today's age, and there's a lot of things why you need a website. So here's a quick marketing lesson. These little guys right here, $32 billion a year goes into dog food. Uh, cat food, pet food. This is an emotional spend, by the way, folks. The person who buys it never eats it, and those guys have no choice in it. Uh, they you basically eat what they're given. So this is a great lesson when you're looking to market your business, your restaurant. How can you all of a sudden get into people's emotions where they start um, uh, doing emotion-based spending? So Charlie Munger, Warren Buffett's business partner, came up with the 25 cognitive biases that uh, basically make people buy or not buy, and they don't really realize, because the brain is easily tricked into making decisions. The brain loves saving energy and takes shortcuts at every opportunity. So I took uh, five of the top of his, I took five that I felt were the most important to the restaurant industry based on uh, his 25. So um, we're going to talk about the number one reason why people buy right now. The number one reason why people buy is the reward bias. It's the power that gives you incentives to take action. Munger's, Munger says this should be obvious, but so many people don't understand how important incentives are for shaping people's motivation to complete a task or take action. So my first question when I post anything online, on my website, in an email is, what's in it for the guest? Sure, the guest wants to know that I have fabulous food and great service and all these five stars and this and that, but really the bottom line is what's in it for the guest. So this person right here uh, has a little pop-up on their website that you could earn points and get free food. A lot of people just love to take action on offers, free food, earning points, a loyalty program, a continuity program. These things are extremely popular, and by putting these on your website, you are creating a... Uh, you're creating people. You're, you're creating the desire for people to want to take an action to come visit you. Uh, this person's giving away their famous crawfish mac and cheese. The pop-up comes up on their website. Uh, now, for me, I'm a wine person, so I don't need a discount. I just want a fabulous glass of wine. So that's my reward: walking into a restaurant, sitting down, a nice wine glass, good glass of wine. So don't think that you have to give stuff away to get people to buy. Uh, a lot of people do, again, take action based upon discounts. And how about this? A lot of people love being eco-friendly. So if you're doing any eco-friendly, organic, local, farm-to-table, any environmental steps in your restaurant, people love that, and uh, they will want to give you business. That's their reward, uh, shopping with you, giving you money, is that you're taking care of a certain aspect of the environment. Number two, the liking or loving tendency. We do business and well, with people and products or companies that we admire. It's uh, plain and simple. If we like you, we're gonna keep giving you money. Now, if that picture's on your website, um, there's a bit of a frown there. That's not a likable person. But here we go. Here's a much more likable person. Same person, just much more likable. Now, here's what's interesting about this. Most business owners do not have their picture on their website, and this is super important. 
the way people like you or love you is by looking at you. And when you're in the virtual world, when you're on the website, by you putting your picture on the website helps a lot of people get to know you. Now, of course, you have to be looking into their eyes. Uh, don't put a picture of your back or, uh, or, or it has to be you looking at your guests and welcome them. Imagine people walking into your door and you greeting them with your back towards them. This is the same thing on a website, folks. People want to be greeted. Now, if you like Gordon Ramsay, if, he already, if you already like him, it doesn't matter what he does wrong, right? So here it explains that he uh, puts his kids in the back while uh, he travels first class. But if you like Gordon Ramsay, you don't care what he does because you will defend all of his actions. And this is the neat thing about the liking or loving tendency. And this also goes with politics. We overlook the downfalls of people because we already have a bias based upon that we like them. So we will close our eyes and keep giving them business or keep voting for them. So here's the Williams family. The Williams family puts the whole family right on the website. If you logged onto their website and that's what pops up, that's what you see, who would not want to give business to the Williams family? Uh, great family, they own a great restaurant, and uh, you're gonna keep going back and back because you've already made that personal connection with them on their website. So the question is, are you likable? Well, not being on your website doesn't count. Again, when you walk into a restaurant and you sit at a bar, within a tenth of a second, you know if you're getting along with the bartender. Am I correct? We've all been through that experience. We sit down and the person doesn't greet us properly. They don't look at us in the eyes. They Just their energy or something's off with that person. In a tenth of a second, you know you're getting along with that bartender or with that server. And that's just, that's just our intuition, right? So if you own a catering hall or if you do a lot of catering in your restaurant, if this person is on your website, she just gets a ring put on her finger and she's getting ready to spend $10,000, $20,000 because she has a wedding coming up, you better be 100% likable because she is going to jump off of your website and go onto a website that she feels very, uh, she feels very comfortable. Remember, this person is a very emotional right now. She just got engaged, and she's getting ready to make an emotional decision right here that's worth thousands and thousands of dollars. So you better be 100% likable. Number three, the social proof tendency. Social proof is a term coined by Robert Caldini in his 1984 book, Influence. It is also known as informational social influence. It describes a psychological and social phenomenon wherein people copy the actions of others. So, you know, the term copycat, monkey see, monkey do. Well, here we go. So when I was in my early 20s, I was visiting Rome and uh, was there with my girlfriend, fiance, now, now we're married. And when they say when you're in Rome, do as the Romans, we all know that term. Well, guess what? I didn't want to be the 23-year-old, 24-year-old American that was going to jail for not paying my bus fare. And in Rome, nobody pays the bus fare. So I had my money in my hand, I got in line, I went to walk on that bus, and there was 20, 30 people boarding the bus, it was busy, people were rushing on, and I simply walked right past the guy to pay because I didn't want to be singled out. I simply followed the actions of the others, even when I had predetermined that I wasn't gonna do that. I made my mind up that I wasn't gonna do it. My mind made a split second decision to follow others. And this is what's happening on your website, folks. When people log onto your website, there's certain things that they wanna to see to make split second decisions. And that's what this presentation is about, about people making quick second, quick split second decisions. Now, if somebody's looking for a barbecue restaurant, where are they going, right? This is easy, we all know this. You're going to a four or five star place, you're gonna skip the two star places. That's just the reality of how our mind works, right? So, I recommend um, if you have a restaurant, if you have a restaurant and you have five-star reviews, that you get those five-star reviews on your website. You don't need to be an overall five- or four-star rated restaurant, but you need to get those up there, and I'll give an example of that as we roll along here. So, now, back to emotions. This place, you know, there's not much going on in here. So, if you are, again, that bride-to-be, and this picture's on your website on the catering hall, a bride's gonna log on to here and say, ooh, oh, okay. When she sees a picture like this, this is emotion-based. These are people having a good time. That bride or that potential customer, your potential guest, wants to see people having a good time. Again, 
This is all emotions. We're talking about emotion-based spending here. So here are the five-star reviews. So people love to see numbers. Five stars is an easy thing for people to equate. All right, so here's what I recommend that all restaurants do. You go on to your Yelp, to your TripAdvisor, to your Google, to wherever people are rating you, you grab some great reviews and you put them visible for people to see on your website. I talk to a lot of restaurateurs and I critique a lot of websites. And when we go through, I'm like, where are your testimonials? Where are your reviews? And I'm like, oh, you have to hit this button here and hit this and you scroll down. And I'm like, no, 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 you've already lost that person. Again, the brain is lazy. The brain doesn't want to work harder than it has to. This is our primitive nature. And you need to make sure everything is in front of your potential guests when they log on to your website. You have three to seven seconds to grab their attention. I urge you, do not make them work. Again, if that young lady comes in that just got engaged, she wants to see everything on your front page. She doesn't have to hit a second page to see your food, to see you, to see this and that. Put everything up in front for them to easily, easily see. So numbers are a great way to, to really boast your accomplishments. Any kind of numbers that you possibly can put on your website are things that you should be using. So the reason why this works, that numbers work so well, is because people easily lie, but numbers don't. So when people see five star, four star, they see over 500 ratings uh, on TripAdvisor, Yelp, these are things that people can easily say, oh wow. And like I showed in my one slide, 500 five star reviews, anybody who's logging onto that is gonna say, well, gee, if 500 people have had a five star experience, that's what I wanna have, and I'm going to jump on board and go there. So McDonald's used, learned this years and years ago, billions and billions served. I remember since a little kid, I've been watching that sign, how many people have been served. And it's always been intriguing me as a youngster of, mom, why can't we go there and do what other people are doing? So number four, the fourth reason people buy, the authority bias. The authority bias is a tendency to attribute greater accuracy to the opinion of an authority figure. Now this is really interesting, folks, because even unrelated to its content, their influence to your to the opinion is 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 amazing. So my first love is uh, I'm a food activist. I love talking about real food and I love educating people. So here I did a, a speech at a running store. This was the first time that I I sort of experienced this influence uh, or this authority bias. I did a speech here on fish how to eat healthier fish, hour long speech. At the end of my speech, people said to me, what are you selling? Uh, we loved your speech, what are you selling? So I said, well, I'm selling some business books, but I'm really not selling them because I just did a fish speech. The odd thing was that I sold out of my business book talking about food, a totally unrelated topic because I was viewed as the expert and people didn't care what I was selling because even unrelated to the topic, people started buying my product. Now, whenever I go do a speech, I sell as much as I possibly can, and bring as much as I possibly can, because I know that people will buy things from me. So folks, if you've had any accolades or awards, anything that shows you as an authority, even if it's unrelated to the restaurant, I urge you to use that in your marketing. Uh, if it's related, that's even better. So put logos, put references of who's written you up, where you've been featured, and things like that. So the Michelin Guide, very well, very prestigious uh, guide that ha has really set apart or made some chefs' careers. I was recently in New York City uh, in the springtime walking up and down. My wife and I were hungry. We were walking up and down the street looking for a restaurant to eat. We looked at several menus. We walked literally two blocks. And we hit this restaurant and we saw the Michelin Guide. And I saw, I didn't even look at the menu because that's my association with authority right there. And my wife and I walked in, jumped in, and had lunch. Now, not saying that, now, of course, Michelin Guide restaurants are very prestigious, and I used to work at a Michelin three-star in London. And so for me, Michelin, oh, wow, ooh, ah, let's jump in and go. Now, I didn't look at the menu. If I would have looked at the menu, I probably would not have walked in here because it wasn't what I was looking for, nor did I enjoy the meal not saying that it was a bad restaurant, it just wasn't what fancied me that day. But I totally, now I teach this stuff, this psychology marketing, and I totally fell for this in a split second. My wife and I consciously were looking for 15 minutes for a place to eat, 
We saw this emblem and we jumped right in within a split second. So again, if you have any type of authority, uh, any kind of award, you need to be boasting this and putting this wherever you can, not only on your website, here it worked on the front door of a restaurant. Number five, the influence from mere association. We can easily be manipulated by mere association. It can be a group of people, the quality of a product, advertising, et cetera. That's why brands use famous people to mo 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 their products. We've all seen this, uh, the Wheaties people, the athletes, the Nike, um, because Michael Jordan wore the sneakers, right? So this restaurant group here, a very well-known, very fast-rising restaurant group. Dan Marino is one of the investors' partners. He's involved in this restaurant somehow. And when you go on their website, uh, Anthony is with Dan Marino. And that right there is that mere influence. And of course, when I was a kid, I promised my parents, I swore to my parents that I was going to play better basketball if they bought me these sneakers. Well, guess what? I didn't play better basketball. Um, in fact, I don't even know if I made the team when I had those. Uh, but this is that influence from mere association why people buy products. So I can guarantee you 100% that Mickey Mantle's not going to show up here for dinner. Uh, he's not even going to show up here because it's impossible for him to. But still, this restaurant is a thriving restaurant. It's doing well. And it's because of the association of an iconic baseball player. Ah, ooh, hotels, they figured this out a long time ago. The presidential suite, uh, you know, Roosevelt slept here. George Washington was on the grounds here. Hotels figured this out a long time ago to name certain rooms the presidential suite because of the association of something that happened 50 years ago or 200 years ago. And uh, I promise you they do tack a little bit on on the price because of this. So the real question now is, you know, we talked about putting this on the website. I did make a reference when you greet people at your restaurant. But the real question is, where doesn't this work? Folks, this works everywhere. It works on every interaction you're in, in person, digital, and print. Uh, so I urge you to understand, you know, that the brain, or just understand that the brain makes quick decisions. And if you're in your restaurant, if you're greeting people, you look at them. Uh, you say hello to them. You become a likable person. In the restaurant, you, you utilize four walls marketing. You talk about your awards. You talk about your, associate, your, your associations. You take pictures with famous people. Anything that you can possibly do in person, in the restaurant, online, in print, on a business card. Somebody once asked me, not too long ago, what do I put on my business card? I said the same thing that's on your website. And that is the uh, five key components, uh, the five uh, psychological biases here that I've talked about. And of course, what, you, what I didn't talk about in the very, very beginning, and this is why people actually visit your restaurant. They visit your restaurant because they want to see your food. Make sure you have food in the first picture on your restaurant. I go to a lot of websites and I can't tell if they're a furniture store selling bar stools or a restaurant serving great food. They want to see your food. Don't make them work. They want your phone number because they want to be able to make a reservation. They want to call you. They want to hit a button to make a reservation and they want to know your address. So those three to four things are the things you must have in clear sight as soon as people log on to your website. And then once you start working in some psychological biases, you'll start seeing some magic happen. You will start, if you run analytics, you will notice that people actually stay on your website longer. Uh, they're navigating it and you're not losing them. And uh, folks, when you lose a guest on a website within two seconds, I guarantee you that they're not coming in to eat with you. So again, three to seven seconds, folks, you need to make, a, you need to make a, uh, a quick impact. So um, we have a number of questions. I'm going to just pick one of them on the legal uh, end, and then Marcus will pick one for the uh, business side. So um, somebody is basically asking, what happens you know, if you do the search report, you know, your attorney says you're good to go, then you file your application, and then the trademark office um, cites a mark that is problematic and, and um, what are the next steps? So, uh, uh, as I mentioned, you know, just because the trademark office refuses doesn't mean you don't have an opportunity to respond to the refusal, and you can argue uh, around uh, any uh, con consumer confusion that might result from this other reference 
um, being on the register along with yours. So just by way of example, you know, you think it's it's really close and, and then you can get around it. I recently had a, a client that produces um, frozen foods, wanted to use the mark Sunday dinner for Italian inspired entrees. And uh, the uh, trademark office cited a reference we knew was going to come up Sunday brunch for a breakfast pizza that was a frozen food. So you think, well, oh, that's it, we're done. Brunch and dinner are both common terms. So Sunday is, uh, you know, in, in both marks. But actually, no, because there were a number of other Sunday marks registered for different kinds of foods, and they were all coexisting. So obviously consumers could differentiate between Sunday dinner and Sunday brunch, notwithstanding that they both referred to meals. We also argued that the that a breakfast pizza isn't like a traditional Italian, you know, spaghetti and meatballs type dish. And we won. So you never um, know um, whether you can get around a refusal. And secondly, you know, I just have a case right now involving a hotel. Um, that the mark was refused registration and this hotel has been around since 1928 and they let their trademark registration expire and then recently decided to apply. And another uh, mark was cited for a wine, if you can believe it, against the hotel because some hotels produce wines. So how are we going to get around this? Probably with a consent agreement, with a coexist, where we reach out to the wine owner who probably could care less that there's a hotel out there with this name and get them to consent and then we will be able to overcome the refusal. So um, just because you get a refusal from the trademark office doesn't mean um, a good trademark attorney can't get you out of the refusal and get you on the register. So Marcus? So I have a question. What's happening with LeBron and Taco Tuesday? <laughs> That's a good one, right? <laughs> I don't think anyone could trademark Taco Tuesday. I think people would say that's a pretty generic phrase, right? I, so, that's what I would imagine. Yeah, a lot of restaurants are upset about he's this. Been, he's been knocked out. Um, I think the trademark office refused him, and I think that there are a lot of third parties coming forward saying, hey, you can't do this. So I don't think, uh, I, I think it's a good idea to stay away from common phrases. Not only will you not get the registration, you'll anger a lot of the consuming public <laughs> who thinks that they own the phrase. <laughs> Excellent. So, you know, um, I'm asked a lot of questions so many times. People say to me all the time, well, do I really need a website? And I say 100% you need a website. Websites are so crucial nowadays. Um, everybody does them. So... You know the thing for the thing for your website is just make sure you're you're putting your own pictures on there. I really like what you said before about stock photos. I see a lot of restaurants that put stock photos on. The consumer knows right away when they log in. Stock photo. Um, I'm done. They, their mind checks out when they see a stock photo. Make sure it's your real food. Really, really do it. Goes a long way. We all. I'm not saying don't put high quality pictures, but stock photos do not do justice to what your restaurant's capable of. And then you don't have to worry about any of the rights issues either. <laughs> Kill two birds with one stone. Okay, so I think um, we're going to wrap it up a little bit early, but thank you very much. Um, if you have any additional questions, we have an email address on the next uh, screen. We'll also, we've recorded this presentation. Um, and my email address is actually in the first page of the presentation, and you can reach out to Marcus as well. And um, we have a great trademark blog, More Than You Mark, if you want to subscribe. And I'll be sending everybody um, a, a, this recorded presentation along with the slide decks so that you have it for your uh, future reference. Thank you again for coming. Bye-bye.